German Ferrari Club wrote to ask about ordering his. Now, where does it stand? I'm Steve Antoon. Welcome to the first of three special CDN telecasts on the new Dodge Viper RT10. One of the most exciting cars to appear on the world automotive scene in years. Believe me, I know. As an editor at Motor Trend Magazine, I've had the privilege of driving one. In the three telecasts that make up this mandatory sales training series, we'll review the history and evolution of this magnificent machine. We'll take a close look at the Viper itself and how to sell it to the special customers it attracts. As you'll see, Viper is not a car for everyone, and not just because of its price tag. It's a no-frills roadster designed for the man or woman who enjoys performance and serious driving. Viper has been making news ever since it first debuted at the North American International Auto Show in January 1989. In fact, Viper has dominated the attention of the automotive press like few cars in recent history. Every major American automotive magazine has featured it as a cover story, some more than once. They've all kept the readers updated on Viper's progress. And, if the letters are any indication, car buffs are ready to take this car into their hearts as an instant classic. Viper is produced at the New Mac Avenue assembly plant in Detroit. Teams of craftspersons, hand-picked, and some of the most skilled workers in the entire corporation assemble Vipers in complete components. Each craftsperson has had over 300 hours of training. Many of them could build this car single-handed if they had to. They are enthusiastic about building this car, and they are determined to do it right. One unique aspect of the Viper assembly process is that the craftspeople work with the vehicle engineers to improve Viper's quality. We get a chance to talk with the engineers personally about any changes we like to make. And they can give us the go ahead right away over the phone. And then the paperwork comes later, but we get a chance to do whatever we want, whatever is best for the car. Can you lift the stand mission so you can lift it up over the... We are allowed a freedom to, uh, to work hand in hand with engineering to uh, do things properly. We have the, the parameters that we dictate the process of the car itself. And uh, through that, we get a much higher level of quality. Uh, it, it allows us to, uh, to do things that you don't do in a normal assembly operation. Quality inspections take place even before the vehicle is completed. Before the body panels are attached, every single Viper is roll tested at speeds up to 95 miles per hour. To help ensure a quality build, production has begun at the rate of only one vehicle every three days. Over time, that rate will slowly increase as demand warrants. Viper is an incredible driving machine, but it's also much more. Here to talk about what Viper means to Dodge is the general manager of the Dodge Car and Truck Division, Marty Levine. Well, thanks, Van. The new Dodge Viper is an exciting sports car in the classic sense, but it's also much more. Three years have passed since the Viper concept car made its debut. Those three years may have seemed like an eternity to sports car buffs, but to the automotive industry, it's nothing short of amazing. No other car in recent memory has been developed so quickly and so successfully. And that makes Viper the first demonstration of what can result from Chrysler's platform team concept. The hurdles that must be cleared when creating a vehicle today are incredible. It's not enough to merely design a good product. We must be able to manufacture that product with consistent, fantastic quality. And of course, there are more federal and state government regulations to meet every year regarding pollution, safety, and fuel economy. Platform teams bring together all aspects of this business to design, to engineering, to manufacturing, to marketing and sales. They literally provide a team approach to problem solving. Problems surface earlier and can be solved easily. 
shrinking the amount of development time required. Platform teams handle the entire development process. There's no handing off responsibility to someone else once your work is done. Everyone is involved in the entire development process from start to finish. And that creates an emotional involvement with the vehicle, a desire to see it succeed. And that translates into better results. As I said, Viper is the first example of the platform team approach. You'll see the next example this fall with the Dodge Intrepid. Viper has given a Dodge a chance to flex its design and engineering muscles and prove that it can still build one of the most exciting cars available. Viper also serves as Dodge's flagship vehicle, enhancing our image as the performance division of Chrysler. Viper is drawing significant amounts of attention from the media and the public, attention that will be increasing the buyer consideration for our other products. It's time now to meet some of the creators of the Viper, men with the foresight, guts, and determination to build a car that many people said had no right to exist. But they knew what a car like the Viper could do for Dodge and the Chrysler Corporation and what it would take to pull it off. Bob Lutz, the president of Chrysler, a former Marine fighter pilot and a European rally driver with a reputation for being one of Detroit's most passionate car guys. Tom Gale, the vice president of product design and manager of minivan operations, leads a design studio that has recently gained recognition for creating some of the most forward-thinking designs in the industry worldwide. Francois Castain is the Vice President of Vehicle Engineering. Earlier in his career, he was in charge of the team that successfully introduced turbocharged engines into Formula One racing. Carroll Shelby is a living legend. He has raced and won at Le Mans and created the legendary Shelby Cobra in the 60s. He has been serving as a Dodge Performance Consultant for almost a decade, and Roy Schoberg, is the executive engineer of Team Viper. Much of his career has been spent developing and building sports cars, making him the ideal person to bring together the expertise which made Viper a reality. Of course, there are many more people whose efforts have played significant roles, including Tom Stallcamp, a vice president of procurement and supplier operations, and vice president of manufacturing, Dennis Pauley, just to name a few. Now we'll let these people and others, the creators of the Viper, tell you about its development in their own words. It was um, a discussion initially that uh, I guess very, very early on, Carol Shelby, Francois Castan, and I, and um, one of us had the, the thought of, well, we're, we're going to have all these great rear wheel drive components for the new P300 pickup truck. We're gonna have a cast iron V10 engine. We're gonna have a new five-speed manual gearbox. Uh, we're going to have uh, very heavy front and rear axles for trucks. And the thought was, why not combine all of that into uh, a very exciting looking show car for the Detroit Auto Show? Something that was simple, something with push rods, something with uh, uh, that you sat up straight in it, you didn't lie down like you do in these 200 mile an hour European uh, type uh, supercars, they call them. And uh, we kind of laid out the perimeters right there and he says, right, said, okay, let's talk to Tom Gale about it. The discussion uh, talked about Cobra, it talked about doing a car that essentially had a lot of those qualities, but was a very contemporary statement and, and uh, so, I really didn't say too much. I just walked away, and I'm, I'm not even sure. There wasn't any direct assignment. I'm not even sure what uh, uh, Mr. Lutz was expecting other than uh, just uh, uh, a lot of enthusiasm and certainly a, a champion for what we were about to do. And, and so we went away, and, and a few weeks later in one of our studio walkthroughs, I, I uh, reviewed some sketches and, and a full-size tape drawing or a full-size uh, Drawing. Even the early sketches in the first clay model were remarkably similar to the ultimate car. I mean, almost nothing changed. And um, I must say that when I first saw the sketches and, and the initial work on the clay model, 
I was initially not that enthused because somehow in my mind I had visualized something that was much closer to the original uh, Shelby Cobra or, or much, more, much more literal uh, modernization of the Cobra. I hadn't been expecting something that was as radically different. Took the old Cobra uh, that I'd built back in the 60s and uh, that was kind of our guiding light, but uh, we knew that we would have to meet a mission, safety, all the things that have come along since the 60s that we didn't have then. We were, we were after a contemporary expression, but when you look back, you would reminisce or you would remember uh, those image qualities and those uh, visual characters that, that would call up, uh, that would call up Cobra, would call up certain, certain things like that. And, and uh, what was particularly gratifying for me was when we were out at the Longley just uh, last November with all the press, and we happened to be on the street uh, with the Viper, and and uh, someone walked by. And just this was a bystander who came by and said, uh, "Gee, it looks like a Cobra." And uh, yet, when you get the two vehicles together, there's really nothing that's the same. They're very different. I'll tell you the first time I saw uh, the body of the body of the show car being painted uh, out at Metal Crafters in Newport Beach in California. I mean, that just, that blew me away. We came to the marketplace within three years with it, which is two years quicker than concepts are usually brought to the marketplace. I, I think the biggest challenge was uh, our, our only real management directive was maintain the image of the vehicle, the appearance of the car. Don't change it. As it turned out, the, the two look identical. The two cars, from the concept car to the production car, look identical, but there isn't a square inch on the vehicle that hasn't changed because of the regulatory issues, the packaging issues, and, and the things that we had to do to make a commercial Viper. So let's put the V10 in. That'll be a good place to, uh, to uh, try it out and work the bugs out of it build a high-performance version out of it, and then people that buy the pickup truck and say, oh, we have a Viper engine in, in our pickup truck. Uh, our first mule, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, was a white uh, mule, and we didn't have a V10 yet, so it was a V8, and the purpose of that was just to find out, are our handling uh, parameters appropriate for the vehicle? And that told us so. The first V8-powered mule for Viper development was completed in December 1989, only six months after work was begun. Ken Nowak recalls the night they celebrated and when Bob Lutz came to inspect it. And he was walking around the car puffing a cigar like he just had a, a brand new baby boy. He just, I think that his, uh, his comment was something like, geez, I, I had no idea you guys were this far along. Uh, of course, he had to drive the car immediately. And it was now about 7.30. Uh, most of Highland Park was empty. It's pretty dark. It's December 29th. And we were pretty worried about that because the drive shaft on this particular car had been machined just a little bit too short. And we knew the car was safe to drive to the show and present to everyone and rev up the engine and that sort of thing. But the new part was being machined and would be installed the next day. We asked Bob to take it easy. <laughs> And uh, we, we discovered that Bob Lutz doesn't take it easy. <laughs> and we just crossed our fingers that everything came out fine. He loved the car. Nothing failed. <laughs> but it was pretty central. He took it around the back lot. We had the car ready for Mr. Iacocca, but it was, it was cool and a little drizzly. And he came down, and, and I was sort of ready to, to give him a, a, a product description. And he didn't want that at all. He wanted to drive the car. That's all he wanted to do. And uh, the first time he hit it, uh, he was he just said, wow. And uh, the second time he hit it, we went through a radar trap at uh, Highland Park, and I was uh, starting to get my uh, driver's license out and ready to make an explanation. But I, I, I judged by the quizzical look on the officer, uh, he knew that that individual with a cigar was someone different, and he knew the car was someone different. So we took uh, a short spin around the area so he got a feel for the car and the handling and the performance. And uh, it, it only lasted 10 or 15 minutes, but then he made the decision and looked at me and, 
he said, well, what's the program? And I said, well, the feasibility of the two mules, and in June, uh, we'll make a decision. And he said, build it now. The real challenge of, of the team was to design the, the car and the engine and the transmission. All of that within three years, or even less than three years, as a matter of fact, because it took us some time before we got the team going, and only by you know, the end of the spring of 1989, we uh, decided to go ahead with the, a new version of the V10 for the car. And it is intuitively, you understand that it's difficult to, to test the car without the powertrain. So the guy designing the chassis and the body were waiting for the engine to be born. Launching off of the Iron V10 from the truck people from Jeep Truck, uh, we developed an Iron V10, the first one to go into our second mule uh, that we called VMO2. Uh, and to find out, okay, now with that power, how does the car handle? Uh, because you, you automatically now have four-wheel steer, two from the steering wheel, and the rear two from your foot on the accelerator. And at this particular point, I don't know if you know that, but we went to Lamborghini to speed up the process and uh, uh, to get the conversion of our truck engine going from cast iron uh, material to aluminum material. Uh, we were not necessarily able uh, within the team to do that quickly enough to support the idea of going all the way with the V10. So through our contact with our friends at Lamborghini, we accept some of their design techniques um, and also some of their prototype suppliers. But our suppliers have been key because the product is a platform to innovate with, and therefore the suppliers had to be on the ground floor. Let's put them all together. Let's start with Tom Gale. Let's start with uh, uh, design, product planning sales and marketing, uh, engineering, uh, purchasing, manufacturing. Let's put them all in the same room and, uh, and let them fight it out face to face rather than scatter them around uh, uh, over 500 square miles of Detroit. Snake pet concept really started with what's called skunk work. That's a Kelly Johnson of Lockheed. We started it. it it's an idea much like a skunk you're, you're not necessarily pretty, you don't necessarily smell good, but you sure as hell are effective. Uh, when the team first moved into the, the big office area we have, which we call the snake pit, um, everybody's desk was facing the walls. And our executive engineer looked around one day and said, wait a minute, this is how it's supposed to be. And, and everybody still was trying to stay to themselves. And, and now our desks face one another and, and we're all together. And, and it just, it really helps you work together. That's the intent of the snake pit. It's just small team, strong focus dedicated resources and you pull the product off in, in very short lead time. Most people know that Viper served as the pace car at Indianapolis 500 in 1991 with Carroll Shelby behind the wheel. But they don't know what Team Viper went through to make that happen. Bob Lutz called me one day and uh when I thought I'd be dead at that time of my life, and says, how about driving the Viper uh, as the pace car at Indianapolis? And I nearly fell over. I, I couldn't believe that uh, here I was. Uh, uh, I, I didn't think they'd let me in the first place. I knew physically I was able to. Well, when we got the assignment to do the Indy pace car, uh, we sort of took it on with mixed emotion. First, uh, it came along at a time that we were very busy doing our program vehicles. But after thinking about it, we thought it was just been a great challenge for us. And everyone just sort of jumped in and says, we can do it, and let's do it, and we want to see our car going around the test track at Indy anyway. The Indy challenge really was, show me, don't talk about it. And so we were in a prototype stage, and we were evolving the prototype. But the company said, we need the Viper for the Indy pace car. At probably two and a half months before the actual race event. And we had no vehicle uh, dedicated for that. We had prototypes working. And so what we had to do in a very quick time was, was focus our efforts on building two more vehicles 
that would be one the Indy Pace car, one a potential backup if it were needed, though that wa wasn't built until about a week before the actual race. We had a month of testing down there, and I got to take everybody riding in it. And then I've done a lot of the test work since then, not not so much the official test work, but I, I'd go over to Arizona to the proving ground and drive it. When I'd be back at Chelsea, uh, I would uh, go out and drive it. I, I don't want to say that I had a lot of input in it, but I had a lot of opinions that I passed on about the car. The, the focus was building that one car getting all the resolutions in there, all the known problems with their fixes, and making sure it would run for an extended period of time at a high speed. And, and our real purpose there, or our mission was, a vehicle that didn't have to have any aside preparation. It was street ready, and yet it went right on the track and ran. If you saw the car going around leading the pace for the pace vehicle, uh, it did extremely well. I think Carl Shelby probably had it up to 140 miles an hour plus. Uh, there was two cars sent. We only used one car. We had originally thought that maybe the car would not be used under the yellow flag, the caution condition, but it was. So the car performed extremely well. We had this one journalist who's kind of a blowhard, one of the big national publications that, uh, that I had in the car. and. Uh, he was acting so nonchalant and uh, like there was really nothing to it. And I noticed uh, when I stopped the car, he had ripped the, uh, the, the handle, the door, the door handle. He just ripped it right out of the, he'd been gripping so tight that he ripped it right out of the side of the door. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Indy car that a lot of people don't know, the car was built here by craft people. They even signed their initials on the frame of the car prior to the assembly of it. Now, you won't be able to see it, but their initials are there. And that was their way of just saying, we took pride in building this vehicle. Team Viper not only produced an incredible car, it also served as a learning experience for the team members and the entire corporation. Once you can get the concept of continuous improvement established in the company to where everybody recognizes there is no status quo, there is no all-time right way of doing it, but that every time you perform that same task, you've got to try to get um, fewer defects and lower costs than the time you did it before. Once you get that in there, um, the, the culture that's the essential cultural change you've got to bring about, is uh, getting rid of the fear of change and getting people uh, comfortable and supportive of change. The change as being uh, not a threatening thing, but a very positive thing that's going to uh, make us competitive in the future against the world's best. It's been an extremely good uh, experience, and I think if anything can be uh, talked about that uh, this team really has shown is, is how well a team can work to get something like this out in a very short period of time. Bringing together all of the disciplines in one room or bringing together all of the disciplines at least in one area where you can resolve problems hands-on, face-to-face communication. Uh, when you're working on front suspension and you've got a steering problem or you've got a brake problem or you've got something where there's an interrelationship with what's happening with the body or what's happening with uh, other components in the vehicle, they get resolved very quickly as opposed to uh, having to wait for a meeting to resolve or, or wait for or memos going back and forth. I mean, it just cuts all of that out. Engineers uh, generally work on components and uh, don't have the opportunity to have a total overview uh, of a whole compartment, say, for example, a whole interior. And by being in a team this small, uh, I not only had started out with responsibility for overview of the whole interior, but gradually I came to be aware of the whole car. Chrysler employees are resilient people, flexible people, and damn dedicated people. And the team and the amount of personal time that these people have put in the project is, has been really exciting. The Viper project was my first uh, exposure to the entire vehicle. 
I was able to you know, put my two cents in, you know, whether it made a difference or not, people would listen, but I was able to put my two cents in concerning the clay models. I was able to talk with marketing people. I actually went on the long lead press previews with uh, the public relations people. I say it's enhanced. It's, it's just been a, a prove out of what we already knew. We knew that if you empower people, if you gave them the uh, ability to get involved early, if you brought them on stream, if you communicated with them, that they took ownership, they took more pride in what they're doing. So I think what we're doing, we're the forerunner for maybe changing the culture inside of Chrysler. I think the way Team Viper has been organized is hopefully how we're going to see the rest of the industry going. To sum it all up, we asked the creators to describe Viper in three words or less. Sex on wheels. Ruth. Uh, and sun force. Gut-wrenching experience. I'd say it's beautiful, fast, what could be the other one? Exciting. Hot. Raw. Voluptuous. Exciting. Big. And powerful. <laughs> awesome performance and imagery. Slick. Stylish. Powerful. A love affair. In the past, when Dodge introduced a new model, there has always been some discussion of the competition. Until now. Viper occupies a unique position in today's marketplace. Quite simply, while there are other sports cars in the same price range, there is no other car in the market like the Viper at any price. Blinding speed, blistering acceleration, and superb handling are the common denominators for many sports cars. What positions Viper uniquely is the emotional jolt that engulfs the driving experience. What kind of Viper prospects should you expect to see? Now, while Viper will appeal to almost everyone, it will be a must-have for its buyers. These buyers are automotive enthusiasts. The people who have been following the Viper ever since it first appeared three years ago. These are prospects who will know as much about this car as anyone. They appreciate Viper as the ultimate example of what's been missing from the new car market. Van? Thanks, Marty. And our thanks to the Viper's creators for taking the time to tell us about its origin and development. Now, for a word about our upcoming telecast. In part two, we'll take a closer look at the Viper itself, what makes it special, and what makes it one of the most exciting cars ever produced. In Telecast 3, we'll talk about what it means to sell the Viper, some of the challenges you'll face, how to take care of Viper customers, and how to keep them customers of your dealership. As a salesperson, you must understand both the Viper and the customers it attracts. So be sure to watch the next two telecasts on what's being called America's ultimate muscle car.
became the parents of the concept car with the 90s regulatory requirements we've alluded to, along with the extreme performance levels we were looking for, and doing it all in three years was a real challenge. We already knew what the body had to look like. That was what the show car was. What the show car did not have was a viable suspension drivetrain system. So we knew that we had to design or engineer a frame, a, a complete suspension and steering system, and a powertrain. Through the use of pre-prototype mule development cars, we were able to quickly establish, and the operative word here is quickly, the basic design, architecture, and packaging of the Viper. They were also drivable vehicles, so we were able to evaluate real handling characteristics. Well, it's obvious the Viper puts a lot of rubber on the road. These 17-inch tires and wheels are some of the widest used on any performance car. Now that's right, Van. Cobra was limited to the tire technology of the 60s. They're about half as wide as the tires we're using on the Viper. Today's high-performance tires are wider with a lower profile for better traction. The real challenge is to take full advantage of today's significantly advanced tire technology. Well, the tires, the contact patch between the tire and the road, if you can't control that, you don't have a car. You don't have anything. Okay, so to me, it's the most important thing to start with the tires. Uh, these are a lot different than Cobra tires. They're a lot bigger. As a matter of fact, our rear tire is a 335-3517. The only other vehicle that's on is a Lamborghini Diablo. We have the widest rear tires around. Front tires are almost as wide, 275 40s. Um, the, the compound and tread pattern is totally unique to Viper, developed by Michelin for the Viper. The tires are the, the building block for the, they're the basic starting point for the handling of the car. And you select those for what type of car you have. We spent a lot of time picking the right tire because it's very important that the tire perform and behave the way that we want it to to get the right characteristics. Well, the main thing that the tires do on the Viper is provide uh, extreme amounts of traction. Uh, the uh, grip to the road under braking and acceleration and also during cornering. Uh, with the performance uh, suspension uh, that allows these tires to develop their maximum, uh, we can pull over 1G on a steady state circle. The Viper corners as well are better than any street car you can currently get. And that was, was one of our goals. And um, it was tough to achieve, but, but we, we did a lot of testing to, to try to get to those goals. And even though the car handles very well, we didn't completely sacrifice the ride of the car. We've designed our tire to get the maximum performance while still providing a pretty decent ride for a vehicle of this nature. Um, it's, it's very important um, in the handling, in the cornering, in the, the G-force you pull, the tires are going to be able to grip the road. Uh, you've got to look, look out for wet handling if the, the customer gets caught in the rain. We've maximized this tire in wet handling without giving up any performance. Viper's large tires are not only key to providing excellent handling, they also provide the balance necessary to transmit the enormous torque and horsepower output of the Viper's engine to the road. Well, that's absolutely true, and during my road testing of the Viper, I found that the tires grip excellently, both in wet and dry situations. However, putting such large tires on a vehicle does create special design considerations. Yeah, that's correct, Ben. Uh, Viper's massive tires require careful tire patch management to pavement, and management to take the full advantage of their size. A large contact area makes the suspension components and their geometry and alignment a very important consideration. Now, Team Viper has been very careful to address these concerns. We wanted a fully rounded, high-performance sports car. There's a real challenge as far as the suspension is concerned to be able to make these tires work properly under all conditions. Mainly what this consists of is trying to keep the tire square to the road. If the tire is running on its corners, you might as well have a bicycle tire. This tire has a very large contact patch. And controlling this, our suspension design team, they, they've had a real fun time designing our suspension to, uh, to accommodate these big tires, because this was a given for the Viper team. The suspension geometry on the Viper we characterize as being a performance geometry. It's specifically designed to take advantage of the high-performance tires that are on the Viper. You know, it's very important that the suspension be set just right. 
to get the maximum characteristics you know, out of the vehicle. Um, engineering, we have designed a lot of um, understeering characteristics and all sorts of things into this vehicle so that it's it's very easy for the customer who's driving. If you want to push it a little on the exit ramp or the, you know, the off ramp, they can bring themselves back under control. The result is a very responsive car with superb driver feedback. You always know exactly what the Viper is doing, and it does exactly what you want it to do. Viper is surprisingly easy to drive. Well, I'd say the brakes are equally impressive. Viper can stop as well as it accelerates and takes the turn. Yeah, that's right, Van. The brakes helped us to meet one of Viper's performance target, that being going from zero to 100 miles an hour and back to zero again in under 15 seconds. This goal was uh, based on the original Shelby Cobra cars of the 60s, which uh, had this ability to, to do this very quickly. And uh, one of the reasons we can do, do it in less than 15 seconds is that the car accelerates from zero to 100 very quickly in about 10 seconds. And then due to the brakes we've got on the car, we're able to stop in about four and a half seconds. Our um, going in philosophy was to put the uh, biggest rotors that we could fit into the wheels on the car. And we have, they're uh, massive rotors, they're 13 inches in diameter, which is bigger than the wheels on some cars. We designed the braking system for uh, maximum stopping power, and we use very large brakes, uh, much larger than you would normally use on a car if you were designing it uh, to be a cost-effective and meet all of the, the minimum corporate and federal requirements. On the Viper, we went, we went way overboard, and I think it's paid off for us because uh, anyone who drives a Viper is going to appreciate the ability it has for stopping quickly. Team Viper has certainly left nothing to chance. Every component has been designed to push the limits of performance. Now that's right, Van. The components must work together as one unit. There can be no weak link. Even the wheels demonstrate this. The wheels are a, a unique wheel. It's a, they're called FFM, or full face module, which is a cast aluminum face and a spun aluminum rim, and they're welded together. And this is done for weight savings. For the size of the wheel we have, the weight, and the less weight you have in unspun weight, the better performance and the better handling the car is going to have. So the wheels, the wheels are unique in that fashion. But all these features rely on a frame that will allow them to operate at their full potential. Well, you know, a true performance car is only as good as its frame allows it to be. And the backbone of Viper's race-bred chassis is one of the stiffest sports car frames ever built. Now, that's true, Van. Keeping in mind the tire patch management we talked about earlier, the very sophisticated suspension Viper has is attached to the frame. The suspension can't properly manage the tires if the frame is moving. Viper frame is a, a very stiff platform from which the uh, suspension can do its job. Uh, if, if it were not for a, a stiff platform, uh, you'd be, um, with this race tune suspension that we have, you can encounter a situation where the suspension may be able to overpower or outmuscle the frame, where the frame becomes more, more uh, compliant than the suspension. Uh, for this suspension and its critical geometry to do its job, it needs a stable platform and we've provided the, the Viper with a stable platform. Cobra did not have a very stiff frame. Uh, its torsional stiffness was very low, and the uh, Viper has a very stiff frame, which allows us to tune the balance and the handling of the suspension much better than the Cobra ever could. And of course, the Cobra was saddled with tires of the time. Our vehicle with the um, much higher cornering potential of the, the large tires uh, requires that it has a, a much higher torsional stiffness for the, the uh, suspension, it gives the, the suspension a stable platform to do its job. Uh, the Cobra had a torsional stiffness of around 1,700 foot-pounds per degree, and uh, we're more than three times that. Viper deals with performance extremes. The frame must be able to handle those conditions. Yeah, such as the 450 foot-pounds of torque Viper's V10 engine can produce. Taming the, the V10 beast, yes. Uh, uh, in addressing the, uh, the monstrous torque that the car has, 
Uh, it was a challenge in that uh, running contrary to most uh, contemporary supercars where the, the drivetrain and the driving wheels is all collected as one piece, usually mid-engine. Our vehicle has a, a very powerful engine at one end of the car and the driving wheels at the other end of the car. So uh, you're relying on the chassis, the uh, frame to transmit that torque. The drivetrain essentially wants to twist the frame up. Uh, that's another reason why we need a, a very torsionally stiff frame so that we don't get the drivetrain under acceleration uh, turning the frame over like a pretzel. Viper's frame is designed with a center spine construction. It gets its strength down the center as opposed to around the perimeter. In addition, the spine is a closed box construction which very few vehicles have. Uh, here's where some of our 90s technology comes in. We use three different materials in the spine construction. The rails and sides are made of mild steel. The top is made of lightweight, high-strength carbon fiber. And the bottom is a T6 alloy aluminum plate, which you're familiar with from the aircraft industry. Well, this is essentially the same type of frame design used in Formula One race cars. But beyond stiffness, the frame must also allow for equal weight distribution among the four corners of the vehicle. How's the Viper's weight distribution, Jim? Well, it's excellent. Our production units are right at 50-50, which was our going-in goal. It was accomplished by, first of all, locating the engine aft of the center line of the front wheels and by doing things like locating the battery in the trunk. And this all leads to the all-important balance between the chassis and the engine. When we put it all together, tires, suspension, the rigid frame, and the weight distribution we've been talking about, the engine then can be used to its full potential. <laughs> Van, if the frame is the Viper's backbone, certainly then the engine is its heart. Well, much of the excitement generated by Viper is focused on its V10 engine. At 8 liters of displacement, 488 cubic inches, 450 foot-pounds of torque, 0 to 60 in just 4.5 seconds. That's impressive numbers, especially for a production vehicle. The real story, Van, goes beyond the numbers. It happens behind the wheel. There's nothing like the feel of a large displacement engine. The driver will experience instantaneous response. Because of the, the large displacement engine and because of the torque that's attributed to the large displacement, uh, the throttle response is virtually instantaneous. He can put his foot down, and depending on what gear he is in, the, the car will either move fast or very fast. There's nothing in between. Even if you're cruising along the freeway at um, posted speeds and you want to accelerate, you do not have to downshift. You can just put your foot into the throttle and you'll just move away from traffic. When you accelerate in the Viper, uh, basically any time you stand on the gas pedal, the car just charges forward and uh, you get an impression of being shoved from behind by a very large force. And it really doesn't matter what gear you're in or what speed you're going. The car will accelerate well up to well over 100 miles an hour up toward its top speed with the same type of effort that it accelerates at slow speeds. And this is different than most cars. Most cars, as you get up into the high speeds, the acceleration tapers off and it takes a long time to build speed. Uh, the car is very forgiving. Um, my experience with it has been that uh, you can ask the car to do whatever you want and it'll do it. And if you keep your head where it's located, then uh, you won't have any problems with it. It is indeed a very drivable car. Uh, the torque curve is very flat from about 1600 RPM or even 1200 RPM up to about uh, 3,600 RPM. It's uh, continually rising from about 400 foot-pounds to about 450 foot-pounds. Viper's all-aluminum V10 is well matched to the central theme of the car, back to basics, tried and true. It is an excellent blend of the best of the past with 90s technology added to accommodate the emission and fuel economy requirements of today. That's right, Van, large displacement for outstanding torque. Like the big V8s of the 60s, there's nothing like good old-fashioned cubic inches. Viper's seemingly endless torque is put to the pavement through an all-new six-speed transmission. It has been specifically designed to match the performance characteristics of the V10 engine. When you've got 450 foot-pounds of torque coming out of the engine and hitting the road via 13-inch wide tires, that's a lot of rubber to move. Uh, so consequently, you've got to have a pretty bulletproof drive line. You know, what, what we've done is basically design the weak links right out of it. You know, you, you, you fix up one thing, you, you know, something else breaks, you just sort of chase that weak link right through the system until it's not there anymore. Uh, the drivetrain has a brand new six-speed Borg Warner gearbox. Uh, we have an aluminum prop shaft, a Dana 307 rear axle, and Dana half shafts. 
So you take off from the intersection, all of a sudden you'll be in fourth gear. You hit the gas, you're still going to move. You're not going to be putting along and your engine's not going to be stalling out. So it's a, nice, it's a nice feature in that way. Because of the torque, you're really, you don't notice it. It's not too annoying when you go from one to four and you're not prepared. So. Well, you know, the one to four skip shift is actually a computer controlled device that locks out second and third gears during light throttle driving. And it's there to help fuel economy. But the Viper thrives when pushed beyond the norm. Hit the accelerator in any gear and surge of power sends the speedometer upward. If you want to really turn the scenery into a blur of color, just downshift, open the throttle, and devour the road. Yeah, true driver's car requires that you establish a unity between the driver and the machine. Viper's transmission was specifically developed to handle a V10's high torque output and makes for a flawless connection between the driver and the machine. And I'm sure we had several engineers on the team that thought it was a crime to cover up the good stuff with a body, but then we had to keep the rain off. Even so, just standing still, a Viper looks ready and willing. Viper's body panels are a type of fiberglass, aren't they, Jim? So fiberglass is used, Van. It's actually a composite material of fiberglass and acrylic resin. Viper is the first American car to utilize a process called resin transfer molding, or RTM, on all the major exterior body panels. Because RTM utilizes continuous strand preformed fiberglass, Viper body panels are more uniform and therefore stronger than conventional fiberglass car bodies. It also has resulted, as you can see, in a class A finish. Well, the benefits uh, mostly are, uh, uh, it's about 40% lighter than steel, and uh, about uh, 10 to 15% uh, lighter than some of the other materials that are available, like the SMC, sheet molding compound type of materials, which is used uh, for the exterior body also on some of the competitive cars. Of course, we have developed a unique paint system for this, which is a low-bake urethane paint system that has excellent uh, acid-resistant properties, excellent durability properties. It's only appropriate that a vehicle with such incredible performance characteristics should have an equally aggressive attitude. The teardrop headlights, large fog lamps, and voracious air intake create a look that lives up to the Viper name, coiled and ready to strike. And being so expressive, the shape itself presented design difficulties. Because of the uh, defenders are molded into the coat, it's a very unique design, and our styling people want to keep that look. So we had to go through a, uh, a development of molding this large hood in one piece, and that was a challenge. The Viper is a complete drivable vehicle, even without the body panels. In fact, it is roll tested at 95 miles an hour before any panels are attached. This is called a hot running chassis. To ensure excellent body panel fit, the chassis has special locator pins to aid in panel alignment. While being a sports car enthusiast, I'm equally impressed by Viper's interior. I tell you, this is a driver's car. To carry the back to basics theme into the interior, keeping in mind the primary goal of Viper being a driver's car. We were able to capture in Viper's interior a 60s feel, yet with 1990s ergonomics and safety. A lot of research went into getting it just right, but again, the overriding theme was keep it simple. One example I recall had to do with the exterior door handles. We were trying to find the right door handle to use when someone suggested why not use a Cobra door handle. Of course, a Cobra had no door handles. Well, Jim, it's obvious that Viper's interior was designed with one goal in mind, to integrate the driver into the car without a lot of confusing complexity. Uh, we started out early on in the packaging process by uh, doing an ergonomic study. We found our optimum position for the steering wheel, the shift knob, the seat, and we started out with a known H-point, which is where the seat is, where your uh, posterior sits in the seat is uh, called the design age point and from that point we developed the ergonomics of this vehicle when it came to the instrument panel we use good old-fashioned analog gauges and we feel that these are actually better type of gauge for a driver's car uh, versus a digital gauge and we designed the instrument panel with that in mind uh, we've got a, a large tack and a large speedometer the shift knob is uh, located where it is uh, because in the ergonomic study, most of the drivers who were sports car drivers and racers wanted to have uh, a, uh, an ease of dropping off the steering wheel to the shift knob. 
Boy, just sitting in a Viper gets your blood pressure up. I tell you, this car fits. There's a lot of leg room for big, tall guys. Uh, legible analog gauges, the shifter's in the right place. Steering wheel's good and adjustable. This is my kind of driving car. Yeah, that's right, Van. Simplicity is the key to high-performance motoring. And be prepared for the nothing less than a driving experience of your life every time you're strapped into a Viper. Of course, once our performance concerns were addressed, we did provide some extras that Viper buyers may enjoy, such as carpeting leather seats with vinyl trim and a Chrysler Alpine six-speaker stereo radio with cassette player. So though the Viper is best experienced as a wind-in-your-hair top-down roadster, Mother Nature is not always so accommodating. A top and side curtain seal out the harsher elements and actually even add to Viper's classic image. The side curtain's reminiscent of those used on many now legendary sports cars. However, most Viper buyers will probably prefer to use the tonneau cover, which strikes a balance between the open-air experience and protecting the interior on less than ideal days. You know, Viper's back-to-basics design in all aspects of the car is really refreshing in the midst of today's high-tech gadgetry. You really sense a union between driver and machine. Yeah, by not including any purely indulgent features, the Viper maintains a sharp focus on its objective, exhilaration. Jim, you've certainly spent a lot of time behind the wheel of the Viper. Tell us your driving impressions of this amazing sports car. Well, Van, one impression I have is you know I ride a Harley-Davidson motorcycle, and the sound and feel I get driving a Viper reminds me a lot of the feeling I get on my Harley, albeit with four wheels. I've also noticed that anyone driving a Viper never wants to get out when their time is up. I think many of us have forgotten, and some of our younger people, of course, never knew just how exhilarating driving this type of a car can be. But you don't have to take my word for it. Ask some of my Viper teammates. After you get over the, uh, the initial shock of how well it accelerates, you'll find that you adapt very easily to it and that there's no special skills required to drive the car. Well, it uh, runs like hell, that's all I got to say. And An instantaneous response by the car to whatever you want to do. If you want to accelerate quickly, it can accelerate quickly. If you want to turn quickly, it turns quickly. If you want it to brake, it stops now. Driving a Viper is, well, wait a minute. <laughs> You're going to trap me here. I, I'm going to make some uh, comparisons to sex and some other things like that. I'm not going to do that. Totally hot. I mean, it's 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 a feeling of raw horsepower. Uh, you know, putting the pedal to the metal and just cruising. It, it, it's unbelievable. You just you get a high, you get a rush. The hair on the back of your neck stands up when you drive this car. Driving the Viper makes you feel 16 and invincible again. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. It's it's liberating. It's a religious experience. And the press loves it too. As an editor of Motor Trend Magazine, Van, you've had a chance to drive the Viper. What do you think of it? Well, like I said, I didn't want to get out when my turn was up, believe me. I've uh, driven the car about 400 miles now, Jim, both on the street and on a racetrack. And uh, I got to tell you, the performance is definitely there. To say it's fast is an understatement. To say it handled great, it handled great doesn't do the car justice. It's a uh, very easy car to drive, very predictable, and more fun than uh, you'll ever have. Jim, it's obvious that you and the rest of Team Viper have done an excellent job in building this car. Thanks very much for coming in and sharing some of your insights. Well, thank you, Van. It's been a pleasure being here, and I hope my being able to share the team's perspective on how the Viper evolved has been of help. Thank you. Thank you. An important part of Viper ownership is the sense of confidence it provides, not only in the vehicle itself, but also in Chrysler Corporation and your Dodge dealership. Viper owners are not the typical Dodge customer. In fact, they're more like Porsche or Ferrari owners who expect quick personal service. Confidence is also inspired by Viper's three-year or 36,000-mile bumper-to-bumper limited warranty. And to enhance Viper warranty service, many of the main assemblies are replaced rather than repaired. Also, the Special Order Services, or SOS, gives Viper repair parts top priority and two hotline numbers are available to help technicians quickly solve hard-to-find conditions. The new Dodge Viper RT10 represents a way of doing business in which the customer comes before all other concerns. In the next telecast, Selling the Viper, you will learn what it means to be a Viper dealer and salesperson. Viper prospects require special treatment, and since there will not usually be floor models or demos available, you must be able to generate and maintain Viper excitement by relying on your personal skills. These talents can be applied not only to Viper prospects, but to any customer you may encounter. So join us in the final telecast in this three-part series on the Dodge Viper and witness the future of Chrysler Corporation today.